This morning, we'll be asking the question, did dinosaurs really die out 65 million years ago? Or is it possible that men and dinosaurs lived together fairly recently? All we need to do is find one piece of evidence, an ancient painting or a stone carving that shows people and dinosaurs together. Does this type of evidence exist? It does. The evidence is right out in plain sight, but my guess is that you've never seen it. It exists in temples in Cambodia, on ancient burial stones in Peru, in the petroglyphs of the Anasazi in the American Southwest, but you'd never know it. It's as though we've been blinded to the truth. So let's take a look and see what we can learn, and you decide for yourself. To do this, we're going to travel around the globe. There's evidence in nearly every country, but we don't have time to visit them all, so we'll just be going to Cambodia, Peru, Italy, and the American Southwest. We'll start by traveling to Cambodia to visit the temples built by the Khmer civilization in the Cambodian jungle between the years 800 and 1300 A.D. These temples were rediscovered by Portuguese explorers and Catholic missionaries in the 16th century, and many were restored in the 19th and 20th centuries. Top Ram, one of the most picturesque, was left in its natural state. It was never restored. Top Ram is filled with stone statues and relief carvings. Almost every square inch of the temple is covered with ornate carvings. Hundreds of decorative stone circles surround familiar animals the Khmer people saw every day, such as monkeys, water buffalo, deer, swan. The carvings all show animals the Khmer saw every day, including this animal. What is this a carving of? It looks like a stegosaurus, a dinosaur. Remember, these carvings were made hundreds of years before dinosaur fossils were discovered, hundreds of years before we learned what dinosaurs looked like. Even if these ancient people had found a fossilized dinosaur bone, they had no way to reconstruct what the dinosaur looked like. The only way they could create such an accurate carving of a stegosaurus would be if they actually saw a living stegosaurus. Scientific examination of the stone reliefs show they have not been tampered with or modified. These are the original stone carvings. The area of the stegosaurus appears lighter, especially in the raised portions, because it was cleaned by a French photographer. Nevertheless, the pantina, which is the thin layer of color or corrosion that develops with age, is still obvious in the recesses. You can see it under the tail, under the chin, in front of both legs, on top of the ground between the legs, above and between the plates on the back. And if it was mythological, how did it come out looking exactly like a real dinosaur, a stegosaurus? Historically, in cultures around the world, mythological creatures are usually a combination of human and or animal features. People take what they know and mix and match to create fictional creatures. But a stegosaurus is not like any animal we know. It looks nothing like an elephant, nothing like a rhinoceros or a hippopotamus. It looks like a, well, stegosaurus. It appears people living in Cambodia about 600 to 1,000 years ago, saw living dinosaurs. But we can't come to such a major conclusion without other evidence. And there is evidence around the world. So let's go to the American Southwest. A people called the Anasazi lived in the American Southwest from approximately A.D. 400 to about A.D. 1300. They left behind their homes, which were built high up on cliffs, and they left drawings called petroglyphs on rocks. These drawings are very interesting. They show people, deer, dogs, eagles, all types of animals the Anasazi saw in their everyday lives. And they show this creature. 
Here's another picture. Now, I don't want to give you any hints about this one, but it looks like a Triceratops. In this picture, we can see a man and a dinosaur that looks like a Brachiosaurus. Now, because of the weathering on the stone, it's a little difficult to see, so let's look at it with a different photograph. Here's a photo of the same rock, and the Brachiosaurus is circled in the lower right. You can see his long neck to the right of the, uh, the circle and the body and then the large tail on the left end of the circle. Here's an enhanced picture that makes it easy to see. It's the same situation as in Cambodia. There are drawings of dinosaurs surrounded by drawings of a deer, a wolf, and other animals the Anasazi saw every day. The Anasazi apparently lived with dinosaurs in America from about 700 to 1600 years ago. What is the evidence in ancient artwork telling us? Could it be that dinosaurs still roamed the earth as recently as 500 years ago? Okay, let's go to Peru. The Pachacuti people lived in Peru from about 500 to 1500 AD. Now, this is the same period as the Khmer in Cambodia and the Anasazi in North America. The Pachacuti liked to carve stones which they placed into their tombs. These are called Ica stones. Ica stones come in all sizes. There are small ones that fit in the palm of your hand. There are Ica stones as large as a dog. All of the stones have images carved into the rock surface. The carving reveals a lighter color than the dark pantina on the outer surface of the rock. For example, this carved stone was found in the Kingdom of Cherpu tomb, and it shows a man being attacked by, you got it, two dinosaurs. Here's another one showing a man riding on a dinosaur. There are thousands of Ica stones, and almost one-third show specific types of dinosaurs, including Triceratops, Stegosaurus, and pterosaurs. Some dinosaurs appear to have been domesticated. Others definitely were not domesticated. Here, in this one, two men are attacking a dinosaur. Keep in mind that modern man's conception of dinosaurs did not begin until the 1800s. The word dinosaur was first used in 1841. These stones do not depict skeletons, but live active dinosaurs, most of whom are seen interacting with man. The obvious implication is that ancient Peruvians saw and lived with dinosaurs. The tombs in the desert of Peru often preserve some amazing artifacts, which are very old, including the beautiful intricate textiles of the Nazca culture, which existed from about 700 AD. Some of their textiles depict living dinosaurs, such as this one here, as do their ceremonial burial stones and pottery, again indicating that dinosaurs were still alive at the time and the ancient Peruvians saw them. Cambodia, the U.S., and Peru are three widely separated locations around the world in which dinosaurs are pictured in ancient art. Now, if it was just two or three instances, we still might dismiss it as coincidences, but it's not. Dinosaurs are shown in art in Russia, China, Africa, around the world. Okay, so let's do an extra one. We've been to North America, South America, and Asia. Let's go to Africa. This is a photograph of a portion of what has been called one of the wonders of the second century world. It is called the Nile Mosaic of Palestrina. It shows Nile scenes from Egypt all the way to Ethiopia and includes pictures of many known animals such as crocodiles and hippos. This portion of the mosaic shows African animals being hunted by dark-skinned warriors known at the time as Ethiopians. They are hunting what appears to be a dinosaur. But that's not all Egypt has to show us. This is a famous slate palette from Heraconopolis, a major city on the Upper Nile that was the capital for King Narmer. It is considered to be the first political document in history. It dates from about 3100 BC. And what do you see on there? It shows two long-necked dinosaurs. Okay, let's go to Europe. 
and we'll look at a different type of evidence. In the 1500s, a European scientific book called Historica Animalium listed and illustrated the animals that were known at the time. It included animals we would call dinosaurs, and it identified them as being living, real animals. Is all this just a coincidence, or is this evidence telling us something? By the way, if I had not mentioned the word dinosaur, what would you have said this image looked like? A dragon, maybe? The word dinosaur was not invented until the year 1841. So what did people call dinosaurs before we had the word dinosaur? Might it be the word dragon? Imagine people and dinosaurs living at the same time. What happens today if a cougar or a bear were found to be wandering through the city? That bear or cougar would be hunted down and killed. Well, yes, today we sometimes do try to use traps and tranquilizer guns, but historically, when dangerous animals and people come into contact, the dangerous animals are eventually eliminated. So, what do you think happened when a dinosaur crossed paths with human civilization? Well, here's a true story as documented by Ulysses Aldrovandus. It's in the Natural History of Serpents and Dragons, Bologna, Italy, published in 1640, reading from page 402. He wrote, The dragon was first seen on May 13, 1572, hissing like a snake. He had been hiding on the small estate of Master Petronius, near Dosius, in a place called Molanolta. At 5 p.m., he was caught on a public highway by a herdsman named Baptisma of Camaldolus. He wrote, the dragon was first seen on May 13, 1572, hissing like a snake. He had been hiding on the small estate of Master Petronius near Dosius in a place called Molanolta. At 5 p.m. he was caught on a public highway by a herdsman named Baptisma of Camaldolus near the hedge of a private farm a mile from the remote city outskirts of Bologna. Baptista was following his ox cart home when he noticed the oxen suddenly come to a stop. He kicked them and he shouted at them, but they refused to move and went down on their knees rather than move forward. At this point, the herdsman noticed a hissing sound and was startled to see this strange little dragon ahead of him. Trembling, he struck it on the head with his rod and killed it. Aldrovandus mounted the specimen, and he put it on display for quite some time in a museum for everyone to see. So, where can we learn more about dragons? What about the Bible? Are there dragons, or should I say, dinosaurs in the Bible? Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, says the following, and I'm reading from the King James Version. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth, by the way, which I made with thee. That means he, he made behemoth at the same time he made mankind. That would be day six of creation. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reeds and ferns. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river. He hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. This fellow's big. He's so big, he can drink up a river. That's a big animal. And this can't be a mythological creature. This description comes right in the middle of God describing how great he is and how great the things that he created are. God is describing something real, the largest animal that he created. 
a brachiosaurus so that Job will better understand how great God is. If this was not describing a real animal, it would be totally meaningless. Some more recent translations say that, well, behemoth is an elephant. But verse 17 says, behemoth had a tail like a cedar. Does this tail look like a cedar tree? Not even close. Other translators say that behemoth is a hippopotamus. Well, here it is, a hippopotamus. Tail looks like a piece of thick rope, not like a cedar tree. What is this describing? It sounds like the largest dinosaur ever found. A brachiosaurus, 20 meters long, weighing 74 tons. That's as much as 20 elephants. When the Bible talks about dinosaurs, it uses the Hebrew word tanium. Now keep in mind that the word dinosaur was not created until 1841. Early translators of the Bible, such as the King James Version, didn't have the word dinosaur available to them, but they accurately translated the word tanium as dragon because this was an animal they knew about. We've now come to think of dragons as mythological, and it has only been recently that the evidence is surfacing and we are learning that dinosaurs lived with man and the term that people used to describe them is dragon. The word tanium is used about 50 times in the Bible, but because modern translators did not know what this word means, they sometimes translated it as dragon, but other times translated it as serpent or jackal. In the next slide, we'll take a look at some examples. As you look at these, Notice that in all of them, the dragons are spoken about like real animals that people at the time would recognize and be familiar with. Once again, I'll be reading from the King James Version. We'll start with Psalm 91.13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Psalm 74.13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Here's Jeremiah 14, verse 6. And the wild asses did stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. Malachi 1, 3. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Yes, the Bible talks about dinosaurs, and it does so in the same manner as it does any other real animal. Dinosaurs are mentioned throughout the Old Testament. Now, why is this important? The key verse for today's message is Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. So let's turn there if you would. It describes some of the things God created on day 6 of creation. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. We know that dinosaurs are real. We have their fossils. Oh, by the way, doesn't take millions of years to form a fossil. Here's a picture of a fossilized hat. It didn't take millions of years to fossilize. I've seen fossilized hams, fossilized pickles, uh, a fossilized cowboy boot with a cowboy's leg still in it. All was fossilized. Fossils don't take a long time to form. And dinosaurs are real. What are dinosaurs? They are land animals. When did God create all the land animals? On day six of creation. When was man created? Also on day six of creation. Based on the Bible, men and dinosaurs had to have lived together, just as we see revealed in ancient art. The Bible plainly says that the land animals, and that includes dinosaurs and mankind, were created on day six. There's no other way to understand Genesis chapter 1. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, 
livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. That includes dinosaurs. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Why is this important? Why are dinosaurs important? Don't we have more important things to worry about and preach about? Drugs, poverty, divorce, abortion, homelessness, pornography, and a whole list of other problems we should be focusing on. Why is this morning's message so important? Because if evolution is true, evolution which claims dinosaurs lived and became extinct millions of years ago, then the Bible's false. Then God did not create dinosaurs on day six, the same day he created mankind. And if evolution is true, then everything was made by natural processes without God. Then God does not own us. And he has no right to tell us how to live. And that means there's no absolute morality. Anything goes. There is no sin. What does no sin mean? Here's what a leading evolutionist said. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. You know, that's exactly what the Bible says. We reject God because we love our sin. Evolution is embraced in spite of all the evidence showing it is not true because we love our sin. That's why we want evolution to be true. Because if it is true, that means there is no judgment and that means there is no need of our Savior. And Christianity is a false religion. We've just looked at a very small part of the historical record. There is evidence around the world showing dinosaurs and people living together as recently as just 500 years ago, from Canada to Australia. But there's even more. Natural science, physical science, geology, biology, paleontology, astronomy, all across the board, the evidence tells us the Bible is true, exactly as written, and the theory of evolution is false. It's just as Romans 1.20 says. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that you are without excuse. You are without excuse. And that's a problem. So there's just one more thing you need to know, and it has to do with you and your relationship with God. The problem is that you have disobeyed God. We all have disobeyed God. Whether you want to believe it or not, God created you and you are accountable to him. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever taken something that does not belong to you? That's stealing. Jesus said that if you look with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. Have you done that? We all have disobeyed God. Romans 6.23 tells us that as a result of our disobedience, we have earned something. We have earned the death penalty. The wages of sin is death. So let's review. Here's the situation. God made the world. He owns it. He makes the rules. We are guilty of breaking his rules. The penalty is death. And that's pretty bad news for all of us. But here's the good news. God sent his own son to die in our place, to pay the penalty we earned so that we do not have to pay this penalty ourselves. John 3.16 says, But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. Jesus died. He was buried. The tomb was sealed. Roman guards guarded the tomb. But here's some really amazing news. Jesus has promised us that if we repent, which means we turn away from our sins and we believe in him, we will have life after death. 
And to show us that was true, Jesus rose from the dead, leading the way. Jesus is the only way we can come to God. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. Through Jesus, we can be forgiven of all our sins and be with God forever. But knowing this is not enough. We must repent. We must turn from our sins. We must desire to stop sinning and put our faith in Jesus Christ. We must trust Jesus to save us from the results of our disobedience. What choice will you make? Trust in Jesus. Be forgiven and have eternal life. Or reject Jesus and suffer eternal punishment in the lake of fire. God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done, so none of us can boast about it. So did dinosaurs and man live together? The Bible says we did. The evidence says we did. So who do you trust? Man's wisdom that is motivated by our desire for sin? Or the wisdom and love of God, the creator of the universe and the creator of you? Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. He will save you.